One of the great anti-war movies, it's Stanley Kubrick's 1957 Paths of Glory. What is this movie about? How should you think about it? Let's review it and analyze it as we normally do, coming up next. Stanley Kubrick made Paths of Glory when he was 28 years old, comes out in 1957, and boy does this movie look like it was made in the 70s, in the 80s even. This movie looks absolutely great. The camera work, cinematography, and then get your hands on the Blu-ray because, as I said, this movie looks 30 years ahead of its time. It does not look like it's from the 1950s. The movie stars Kirk Douglas as Colonel Dax. It's set in World War I in 1916, and the side of the military we're looking at is the French military in World War I, despite that the movie uses British and American actors to portray the French. Now already there's something to notice here with British and American actors. You could probably guess we're not talking about the French in World War I, although we kind of are. We're also talking about the British military, British Empire, and the American military, the American Empire. This is 1957. We've just come out of the Korean War, the Korean conflict, quote unquote. World War II was 15 years ago. And at this point for Kubrick, there's some deep cynicism and I mean that in the classical use of that word, the original cynics uh, in, in the Greek, that about the military bureaucracies, about war in general, uh, about the reasons for war, about hierarchies and bureaucracies. Uh, Kubrick, this is a dominant theme, and of course in his movies, that he will be against or questioning uh, hierarchies and authorities and bureaucracies. This movie does it very well. In fact, this might be my favorite Kubrick movie, or at least one of them. It just is so very good. The movie has a basic plot where two generals start off and plan a, a charge against a German position called the Ant Hill. We see it through binoculars. And between the French line in the trenches and this German Ant Hill, there's sort of a vast apocalyptic landscape that you've seen in World War I movies, pocked with craters and barbed wire. Well, the French are going to have an assault, or make an assault on this Ant Hill led by this Colonel Dax, played, as I said, by Kirk Douglas, who we see him in the in the trenches. He's going to rally his men, and he does have them charge the anthill. The assault on the anthill fails for various reasons, and the generals want to hold several men, in fact, 100 men in the company responsible. They whittle it down to three, and they're going to try and execute three random men from the regiment Colonel Dax is going to defend the three men. We've already seen the three men in this movie, and they've been screwed over in one way or another by their superior officers, and of course the generals. And one of the generals even ordered during the assault on the anthill an attack on his own soldiers, an artillery attack. Captain Nichols. Yes, sir? Order the 75s to commence firing in our own positions. So this movie is very cynical about military justice, or injustice and the inability of the idealist Colonel Dax to one, uh, take care of his men here and to deliver the truth in such a way that it's persuasive so that these men won't become executed. There's a pretty simple division between the elites in this, which is the generals and then the ordinary men in the trenches. The first scene you get shots of these generals in a nice opulent European mansion with all the trappings of European civilization, uh, older artifacts, paintings and such, and they, they're squirrely and they move all around the scene. And then what happens, the very next cut after this scene is to a grubby man in the trenches. And then we go through the trenches with some great tracking shots, forwards and backwards tracking shots of the actual trenches, which they built from scratch and here look immaculate and very realistic. So what's at stake in this movie? So first of all, the generals, both of the generals, one of them is played by a man who looks like a very nice, jolly British general in any old good World War I or World War II movie with the generals on the side of right commanding the, the other officers who command the regular men and things should go well and we're going to defeat the Nazis and defeat the Germans and that's what's happening in this movie, attacking the Germans. But one of the elements of cynicism is the fact they're charging the ant hill. The ant hill, we do see it as a big hill, but the associations of that word mean that this is nothing. They're actually going to go conquer nothing or very little. As the opening narrator says, the line, the French line, barely moved at all in two years during World War I, as we know that's historically true. Going to conquer an anthill means all these men are going to get killed, 50% of them. 
for the sake of this general who will get another medal. That's one of the reasons why the general wants this to happen. And the other one, the jolly general, he seems like a very nice, pleasant man. But in fact, as we learn, you should be paranoid about everybody in this military hierarchy and shoot all hierarchies in general because they're out for their own good, they're self-serving, and this general assumes that everybody, in fact, is. Now that contrasts with one, the ordinary men in the trenches who are grubby and dirty, and we've seen the World War I movies before. It's a very nasty business living in these trenches for months at a time. As well, it contrasts with Colonel Dax, who, as I already said, is an idealist and believes in truth and justice and the law and defending these men and their rights. Now, it may look like Colonel Dax is a hero, and in fact, he kind of is, or attempts to be one, even though, and big spoiler alert here, the three men are actually executed for the non-crime of being cowardice, even though we see that they're not during the battle of the charge against the anthill. Colonel Dax is an idealist hero, and yet he, the, one of the movie's points is, I think, that he actually goes along with this mil military system, the gigantic bureaucracy, and remains a part of it in the end, and adheres to its rules and to its standards and does not break away from them. Now, I know that's a difficult thing to accept for some of you because, of course, what is this military officer going to do? Is he, can he just quit? Well, maybe, maybe not. But the movie clearly says that this idealist is going to take his men back to the front, the place where all those injustices happened, where the general was going to bomb his own men with the artillery, where the men could not have possibly taken the anthill because it was insane to charge, to charge it. And of course, the horrible conditions in the trenches and the injustices committed by the generals who are still, one of whom is still in charge by the end, end of this movie. Nevertheless, Colonel Dax is going to take them back to the front once again for the same old stuff. Now, why is this the case? The end is really interesting because Colonel Dax tells off this jolly general and the general reveals that he is self-serving and paranoid and he assumes everyone is that way. But Colonel Dax gets his moment in the sun and he gets to declare his defiance. I apologize, sir, for not telling you sooner that you're a degenerate, sadistic old man. And you can go to hell before I apologize to you now or ever again. Then he goes and he listens to the men on leave at a bar and they're hooting and hollering. And what are they hooting and hollering at? A German woman who has been captured and brought out for their entertainment. This is the only German we see in the entire movie. The only member of the enemy, even though the three men are charged with cowardice, quote, in the face of the enemy. They never see the faces of the enemy, of course. That's the irony. This woman is being used. She's crying. She sings a German folk song. And this immediately changes the men the ordinary soldiers in the bar from hooting and hollering and wanting wanting some salacious entertainment to sort of crying along with her and being sentimental and nostalgic. It's a weird movie moment, and if this were all the movie was doing in this scene, it would be kind of schmaltzy and silly. But Colonel Dax is listening to this, and that's the key. He's the observer here. What does he get out of it? He learns or to have faith in the masses, these masses of men in their own emotions and their own sentiments and their own compassion for humanity. They have compassion on the German woman, something he was looking for in the officers and the generals to have compassion on the three men who are going to be executed, and they, and they didn't. So he regains, I think, some faith in humanity by listening to the masses, and he recaptures his idealism through, I think, the scene of schmaltzy sentimentality, which only happens in movies where people change from wanting salacious entertainment to, you know, a blubbering along with this woman. He regains his humanity, and yet, he, what does he do next? He takes them back to the front, and the last thing we see in this movie is him saluting the guard at his office door, and he's going to once again return to the fold and be a colonel and we can only imagine this is eternal return. He's going to go back and do the same thing. The men are going to charge. A lot of them are going to die. The general is going to screw everybody over while enjoying their parties and their European mansions. And so Colonel Dax, if you can believe this, I think this is a valid rating of the movie, is not only a hero of kind or would-be hero. He's an enabler as well. And he is part of this system that you know he doesn't criticize or try to overturn doesn't walk away from, doesn't help the men more than he, he, he could. 
And so that's a key to this whole movie is that this this uh, colonel through his new found sentimentality through a schmaltzy scene is going to lead these men to their deaths once again. I think the end of this movie then is extremely bitter and extremely cynical and that's what gives it its special anti-war bite because at this point in military history the state is in charge of militaries and is beginning at least in the United States to prosecute wars uh, not voted on by Congress and uh, they're called conflicts as the Korean conflict was the Vietnam conflict and so on and then these giant military industrial complexes these giant bureaucracies are in charge of war forgetting the ordinary people and just using them as ants so this is a deeply cynical comment on Kubrick's part but he's got something going here the spirit of defiance that would come in the late 50s and certainly in the 1960s in America and in Europe the spirit of defiance trying to at least defy the bureaucracies is in this very movie paths of glory from 1957 so it's definitely worth watching for that what do you think of this video please comment on it and let us know what you think and subscribe to this channel for more great content thanks and have a great day